Hey everyone, um, thanks for coming and welcome to the 2023 AIC workshop. Um, before we start, I wanna let you know and feel free to have your mic and camera off during the workshop. All questions can be put into the chat. Um, joining us today is Brent, the primary patent examiner at the United States Patent and Trademark Office with a focus on data processing of sensor measurements. And then we have also Brett Balram, a primary patent examiner at the United States Patent and Trademark Office with a focus in the optical systems technology. We can't wait to see the main division competitors present for semifinals next week. And so now I'm gonna pass the torch to Brent and Balram. Thank you. Uh, give me a moment while I set up my screen. Okay, so I am Brent Fairbanks. I am one of the assistant outreach coordinators representing the San Jose office and a primary examiner at the US Patent and Trademark Office. As noted, I'm joined by Ballroom who will be speaking later in the presentation. Um, as, a, as a bonus uh, afterwards, uh, ask me why my name and the name of your city are the same, um, but I'll save that for later. So, this presentation is purely infor informational. Uh, it's not actual binding legal advice. So please consult with an appropriate source um, for legal authority and guidance if you need it. So intellectual property goes all the way back to the founding of the country. Uh, written into the constitution in article one is the phrase, the Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And from this statement, we have derived all of patents and trademarks and copyright law. The use of patents, copyrights, and trademarks has a significant economic advantage. Uh, this slide shows you so a few statistics about the difference between industries with IP exposure and those with not, without IP exposure in particular. And the next slide drills a little bit more into the details. So we can see that there's about 44% of all jobs in the United States are related to IP, um, with a share of about half of the gross metric growth gross domestic product um, and almost an $8 trillion contribution as of 2019. It's probably gone up since then. So it's a good idea to have an IP strategy if you're thinking about starting a business. Um, having an IP makes you more attractive to investors or if you want to build up the business to sell to buyers. Having IP protection gives you some deterrence, uh, some defense against a competitor getting into your space. Um, it adds, gives you the ability to compete globally um, and grants you essentially a property right that gives you more value for your company, going back again to the attraction to investors. We see that there are about six steps in developing a strategy to effectively use IP. The first thing to do is take a good look at what you might have, what you would want to prioritize as your key idea. Um, the second step is to take a good look around and see who are your competitors? What sort of uh, protections do they have? What sort of ideas do they have? Um, the third point is how quickly are things changing in the industry? Um, if it's something you know high tech related that's changing on a weekly basis, um, if you're writing the next competitor to chat GPT, um, that's something that you need to be aware of. And given that, when you know how fast it's innovating and you know what you want to do, you need to figure out how you would want to protect the intellectual property that you're creating. From there, develop a plan, set up some goals, and get some help to go and implement things. If you're unclear about what sort of IP you have, we have a handy tool on our website called the IP Identifier. It gives you a six question quiz um, that lets you figure out what do you have. 
um, and from there figuring out what's the appropriate way to protect what you actually have, whether it be a, a patent filing, a trademark filing, or something that you just keep to yourself and don't tell anybody, um, all of which we'll talk about as we go through the slides. I've mentioned it several times, but there's four basic types of intellectual property. Um, patents, which is where Ballroom and I work most of the time, cover new innovative ideas um, where you tell everyone how you did it. And in exchange, the US government gives you 20 years of exclusive use of the idea that you've told everyone. Um, the second is a trademark which identifies where a good or where a service actually comes from. For example, everyone knows that coffee comes from Starbucks or that Starbucks gives you coffee. Um, then there are copyrights, which are covering things like artistic expression in terms of um, the written word, books, or music. And then as I alluded to before, some things you just keep to yourself the uh, secret formula for Coca-Cola or the secret recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken. So getting into the first, or actually in, the, in terms of this slide, the second area is trademarks. So a trademark is some word or some symbol, um, something that identifies where something comes from. So if you see the uh, green logo for Girl Scout cookies, um, or in particular, if I see it on a box of Thin Mints, I know where those came from. Um, the Golden Arches clearly identify that this is where hamburgers come from. So the, they come in three different types. There's uh, trademarks, uh, service marks, and registered trademarks, as shown at the bottom of this slide. Um, they're, they're very widely used. Most companies have them. Uh, this is a listing of the 20 top brands and showing the different trademarks that they have, which are most likely familiar to everyone in this presentation right now. Trademarks come in three different levels as shown two slides ago. The first one is what's called a common law trademark. Now that's used some, that's for something that's used in commerce. Um, it may be just a word, a, um, a restaurant name or a product name that you come up with and you use to identify your business. Um, but the protection for that is going to be limited to the area that you're in. So if you start a company in, in Fairbanks, then someone else could conceivably start the same type of company with the same name in Nevada, say. Um, and both of them would be considered to be trademarks within their particular region. Note that the United States is, is whoever came up with it first, um, as opposed to international trademarks, which are almost always whoever was the first to go and get the trademark. So a, a common law trademark is easy to come up with, it's easy to use, um, but it does have limited scope and limited protections with it. Which brings us to a federal registration. If you come to the US Patent and Trademark Office and file for a trademark, now you have made a public notice that this is my, this is my mark. This identifies some good or service. Um, I now have the ability, once it's granted, to bring action in federal court to prevent somebody else from using my trademark. Um, it gives you protection across all states of the union and um, can be used if you need to do it um, with border protection in order to prevent somebody from importing products that are using your trademark uh, and don't have your permission to do it. So trademarks to be good and effective need to be somewhat unique um, in their identification. So a few examples 
on this next slide are, as I mentioned before, Starbucks coffee. It, an interesting point about this is notice that Starbucks doesn't have the name coffee or the, the word coffee in their name. Um, it's a stronger trademark because until they actually started making coffee, no one would have ever associated the name Starbucks with anything. I, maybe I would have gone with Battlestar Galactica, um, but definitely not a cup of coffee. In a similar way, the, the Nike swoosh is fairly distinctive as is the uh, Target logo. Trademarks are not limited to just words. They can be designs, as shown on this page, but they can even be colors. The co particular color that Tiffany's uses for their gift boxes, shown on the left, is covered by trademark, as is the particular color of brown that's used by UPS, or the green used by John Deere tractors. Um, trademarks can cover things like odors. If you've ever cracked open a fresh uh, container of Play-Doh, you know that it has a particular aroma to it, um, and that is covered by a US trademark. Um, I didn't really realize this, but walking into your local Verizon store also has a particular odor that they generate and pipe into the air and have trademarked. The uh, use of trademarks extends also to sound. Um, I would assume everybody is familiar with the three-tone NBC logo, which I'm not going to sing right now, um, or the sound the Pillsbury Doughboy makes, or even the dingling sound from Mario Brothers, all of which are covered by trademarks. Now, related to trademarks is the issue of is something that's called trade dress. And that is covering how something looks. Um, the shape of a Hershey's Kiss um, is a particular design, if I would call it, of uh, wrapping around a piece of chocolate. The shape of a Coca-Cola bottle is unique enough um, and the look of an Apple store. All of those are things that are covered by trademark. Because if you look at a Coca-Cola bottle, it looks like a Coca-Cola bottle and it identifies what the beverage is that's inside. To get a trademark, um, you pay $250 for a particular mark on one thing. Um, if you're using the plus system and the plus system gives you, um, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly the, the details on this, but basically the, the standard gives you more services for a, a higher price um, from the trademark office. I think it's that they do um, a search across multiple areas that can be trademarked. Um, and the total cost is going to vary some based on the type of filing that you put in. Um, normally, you have a single mark for a particular application. So you know, that mark could be in the example I did before for a brand of coffee. Um, if you wanted to use that same mark on a different area, say clothing, if you wanted to make a bunch of sweatshirts and have your trademark on them, then that's now a different, um, um, <laughs> the, a, a, a different class that's put into the application. And moving on to trade secrets, I believe this is the part where I, I hand the presentation off. That sound right, Balram? Yep. Um, okay. Better so roll. let me let me stop sharing so that you can share your version of the slides. All right. Give me one minute, folks. All right. Can we see my screen? Yes. Yep. All right. Perfect. So thank you, Brent. So now we're going to quickly go over trade secrets, copyrights, and then we're going to wrap up with patents and get to 
some of your questions at the end. So first of all, what is a trade secret? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a secret. So for trade secrets, it's important to know, first of all, that the USPTO or the United States Patent and Trademark Office neither reviews nor regulates trade secrets. It's actually up to the individual or the business to maintain a trade secret. So some examples of trade secrets would include, as Brent mentioned, the KFC recipe, uh, the recipe for Coca-Cola, and the Google search algorithm. So if you have formulas, patterns, programs, devices, methods, or processes, you may want to consider protection via a trade secret. Different factors you'd want to consider when determining to use a trade secret would include things like figuring out what the value is in having the information against your competitors. Um, other things to consider is what precautions are taken to safeguard the information and what is the amount of money and effort expended in obtaining and developing that information. And finally, a last consideration you should make um, is evaluating the time and expense for others to acquire and duplicate the information. Which brings me to my next point on ways to lose a trade secret. So as we know, trade secrets, they're maintained within company confines. Uh, they're generally protected by signed agreements between employees and the companies. So these contracts may require things like non-disclosure um, of prop proprietary information and non-competition after leaving employment. This is what would be a good example of what falls within a reasonable level um, of effort to maintain secrecy and to keep the information out of the public domain. However, without these legal agreements, you may lose the benefit of your trade secret. Another way you'd lose your trade secret is by competitors reverse engineering your product. That's why we don't too often see a physical machine or an apparatus being a trade secret. Now, with today's technology, it's hard to imagine you wouldn't be able to reverse engineer the formula for something like Coca-Cola. However, due to their trademarks, as Brent mentioned, and marketing efforts, their marks are actually now much more valuable than their formula or their ingredients. So as you can see, in the real world, intellectual pr property production can easily be utilized as a holistic ecosystem where initially you may have something like a trade secret protecting your idea, but then later you utilize trademarking as your business strategy. One last item to note about trade secrets is that the Defend Trade Secrets Act of 2016 made it possible for an owner of a trade secret to sue an entity in federal court when their trade secrets have been misappropriated. For example, if a former employee leaves the company and tells a competitor the trade secret, they'd be liable to a federal lawsuit. But keep in mind, you did, you did the company would have had to take diligent steps to protect their trade secret. And jumping to copyrights. So a copyright is a form of protection to the authors of original works of authorship, including literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, and certain other individual intellectual works. So a copyright is a bundle of rights that gives the owner the right to make and distribute copies, uh, prepare modified works, and perform or display the work publicly. It's also important to know that we are all also copyright users. Whenever we read books, watch movies, listen to music, or play video games or use software, we're using copyright protected works. So even if you're not the owner of a work, you still may be able to use it. In addition to buying or licensing works, you can also use one of the Copyright Act's exemptions and limitations, which are found in Chapter 1 of Title 17 of the United States Code, or you can rely on works in the public domain. So just to expand a little bit more on public domain, works in the public domain are those that are never protected by copyright, such as facts or discoveries, or whose works works whose term of protection has ended either because it expired or the owner did not satisfy a previously required formality. So currently all pre-1926 US works are considered to be part of the public domain because copyright protection has expired for those works. And finally, we, we get to the last type of intellectual property, patent. So a patent gives the right to exclude others from making, 
using, selling, or importing the claimed invention throughout the United States for the duration of your patent term. So in exchange for this protection, a patent application provides public disclosure of the invention. So that's the opposite of a trade secret. And the reason for this is that so the public can benefit from your idea and expand on it. So let's dive into patents. There are three different types of patents that you can apply for. So the first, which I exclusively examine and which is the most common, falls under the category of a utility patent. The other two include design patents and plant patents. So for utility and plant patents, your term for protection would be 20 years after the filing date. And for a design patent, your term would be 15 years after the patent grant date. So a utility patent will be something that's a process, a machine, a manufacturer, or a composition of matter. Things like a new way to make a lens um, or a new type of camera or a new pharmaceutical drug, those would all be classified as utility patents. Now for a design patent, it's really more about the ornamental structure or the shape of the device. So simply put, a design patent is really for how something looks, not necessarily the function or how the device works. So some examples of a design patent would be things like jewelry, packaging, or computer icons like emojis. And finally, the third type of patent, the plant patent, uh, includes a new variety of plant that's asexually reproduced. So a couple examples of plant patents would be things like cotton candy grapes and Haas avocados. Uh, here's a really cool graphic that Brent created specifically for Alaska. So in it, we can see the top few categories of inventions and ideas coming from Alaska inventors. The biggest sector falls under earth drilling. But if you take a look, there's a lot of ideas under diagnos diagnosis surgery identification animal husbandry and wireless communication that have been patented in the last three years from your state. Uh, another cool visual here represents the breakdown of utility and design patents over the last three years. Again, if you recall, design patents are strictly for so how something looks and utility patents are generally for how something works. So how does having the, a patent benefit the public? Well, a patent really is a quid pro quo, where in exchange for 15 or 20 years of protection, the inventor discloses how to make and use the invention. So this information is printed on the granted patent, which is available to the public. From reading the patent, the public is able to expand on the ideas disclosed in the patent, thereby accelerating development in that technology. Here's some key information on when to file a patent application. So back in 2011, thanks to President Obama signing the America Invents Act, the United States switched over from a first inventor to switched over to a first inventor to file system for any applications filed on or after March of 2013. So if you want US protection, that means that you should file within one year after you publicly disclose your idea. If you file after that 12 month window, you run a risk that your own disclosure could be used against you to reject your patent application. And if you're looking for international protection, you'll wanna make sure to file in the respective country before any public disclosure. Now, there are risk, risks involved with disclosure, where one of them, as I just mentioned, was that if you file your patent application more than a year after public disclosure, it could be grounds to be used against you. This is where I strongly, strongly recommend that if you do choose the route of public disclosure, definitely get consultation from a patent attorney on these matters that are up on the screen, such as what you can say, how much should you say, and finding the wording for your crowdfunding campaigns. Um, here's a rundown of filing fees that you can expect to incur when filing for a utility patent. Keep in mind that these are the minimum fees that you'd incur, and you may have extra fees depending on the number of claims, uh, late responses, non-electronic filing, and other case-specific surcharges. Also keep in mind that these are the USPTO fees and not the attorney fees. Now, notice that the large entity fee is different than the small and micro entity. 
So I really, I just want to quickly run down the differences. So a small entity status is given to inventors that are either individuals, nonprofits, or small businesses, which is defined as 500 employees or less. And a micro entity status is given to any small entity that has filed no more than four previous applications. The income is not greater than three times the median income. So that number would be around $212,000. Um, and the application has not been assigned to another entity outside of a micro entity. So what that last part means is that you must not be under obligation to assign, grant, or convey a license or other ownership to another entity that does not meet the micro entity income or number of patent application requirements. So before I wrap up, I just wanted to give a quick breakdown of the US Patent and Trademark Office. So we are a fee-based federal agency. So the office and its employees do not run on uh, US taxpayer dollars. Uh, as of last year, we were at about 13,000 employees where about 8,500 of us were patent examiners and 700 were trademark examining attorneys. Now on the patent side, there were almost 647,000 patents filed and 361,000 patents granted. And on the trademark side, there were about 788,000 trademarks filed with about 453,000 trademarks issued. Um, we're in, headquartered in Alexandria, Virginia, and there are also four regional offices across the U.S., which are located in Detroit, Denver, Dallas, and San Jose. So with that, I'll just take the next few minutes to go over the resources that are available to you all. We have great resources available to the public, including application assistance, education, and even training. And I can't stress this enough, that if you're stuck on where to go or who to reach out to, this website, uspto.gov slash free services, um, is tremendous and has been compiled really comprehensively. So you're able to find the right place you need to be to get your questions answered. Um, as I mentioned, we do have four uh, regional offices um, that are in Detroit, Dallas, Denver, and San Jose. And the regional offices work closely with intellectual property practitioners, startups, um, and job growth accelerators. They also collaborate with local science, technology, engineering, and mathematics organizations on outreach and education programming. There's also the IAC, or the Inventors Assistance Center, which is staffed by former supervisory patent examiners and experienced former primary patent examiners who answer general questions concerning patent examining policy and procedure. Uh, another great resource is the Patent Pro Bono Program, where you can find out more information at the link at the bottom. So what that does is essentially matches you to an attorney who can then work with you free of charge as long as you meet the requirements of the program. Now, still keep in mind that although the attorney fees are free of charge, the USPTO fees do still need to be paid by you. And here's a map of the pro bono program um, organizations. As you can see, Alaska would fall under the CLA network on the left-hand side in the dark blue. We also have law school clinics, which allow law students enrolled in a participating law school clinic program to practice before the USPTO under the guidance of a law school faculty clinic supervisor. More information can be found at the link at the bottom there. And now we come to my favorite local resource, the PTRC. So this is a wonderful place to begin your journey because the PTRC staffs librarians versed in all things USPTO. They can help you navigate our tools, point you to the right place, and even teach you how to use our patent public search, which has strong parallels to the search tool we use as examiners to find prior art. So I would highly recommend checking out your local PTRC. And as you can see, there's a PTRC at the Mather Library at the University of Alaska. And with that, I'd like to conclude there and open up the floor for questions from you all. Uh, one quick thing, uh, the upcoming events, I'll leave that slide up here if you guys wanna jot that down and you can sign up for these events 
um, on USPTO.gov slash events. I All right, I guess, yeah, sure, go ahead, Chris. Um, so I have a idea that I'm going international with. If I file with the US Patent Office and it's disclosed, what's to prevent another country from looking at the US Patent Office contents and taking my idea and running? That's a great question. So ideally, the other, the international person from the other country, um, when they file rights to your invention, since you filed it first, ideally the, that country's patent office should find your disclosure and reject their application based on your invention. Also, if you wanted to sell product in that country, you can file for uh, patent protection with their patent office um, and use the legal protection that you get there to prevent someone else from selling your idea. Yeah, it's really important to know that when you file at the United States Patent Office, your rights are only covered in the US. So wherever you're planning to do business or sell your product um, in another country, definitely that requires its own patent application to that country. So why hasn't the U.S. Patent Office joined with uh, like WIPL? So there are a few treaties. We have the, correct me if I miss one of them, Brent. I think there's a Hague <laughs> Treaty, the PCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty, um, and the Paris Convention, right? Am I saying that right? Yes. Uh, those are the three I know about, but um, yeah, those are all agreements, Brent. I would, I, well, to, I think what you're asking is um, for essentially worldwide protection. Um, the U.S. is a fully participating member of uh, WIPO. Um, we were also a member of a group called IP5, which are the United States Patent Office, the European Patent Office, Korea, China, and Japan. But patent rights are subject to national law. Um, and if you want protection in Japan, say, then you are asking for protection under Japanese law and need to have a patent that's actually granted by the Japanese Patent Office. Does that answer the question? That, that answers that question, yes. Um, and I do, I do have one more question. Okay, um, next question. <laughs> so um, the classification of the invention, uh, which I'm not going to disclose here, um, is one that uh, apparently according to, um, I forget the exact, I, I've got it written down, but there's a law in the United States that says I cannot sell that invention in the United States under underwriter laboratories. Um, would something like that, even though it could be sold and utilized everywhere else on earth, would that be something that um, the U.S. Patent Office would just reject because of that? Or is that something I should still pursue with the U.S. Patent Office? The Patent Office is not going to reject it based on the saleability in the United States. Um, we're looking at whether your idea is novel. Is it, is it something that was obvious or, um, <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've lost my terminology. I should have this memorized. Anticipated <laughs> but and non -obvious. Anticipated, thank you. Has it been anticipated by another invention or is it not obvious that you could put multiple existing inventions together? Um, that's our job. Um, it sounds like you were getting into an area that I'm totally unfamiliar with. Um, but as far as the idea goes, you could, I believe that you should be able to get a patent on it. Okay. Yeah, it is truly a novel idea, but, uh, as far as I'm aware, there isn't a patent on there yet. Mm -hmm. No. 
Thank you. Yeah, so as long as the current state of technology supports your idea, um, that's pretty much the how you would overcome the 101 or the eligibility issue. Um, as Brent mentioned, that saleability of the idea, that is not really what the USPTO is concerned about. Thank you. Is this um, uh, slide deck that was presented, is that available to be downloaded? Um, or is there like a web link where I can get a copy of it for my own notes? Uh, Mary, I think we had sent over this uh, PDF if you want to jump in here with the... Um, yes, it will be available as well as a recording of this um, will be available for any of the competitors. Thank you. Any other questions from the group? Um, I have one. What's one of your the favorite things that you guys have that you have looked over and approved a patent on? Can you share that? Sure. One of the one of the first patents that I granted as a, a new examiner <clears throat> was for a device that bolted to the outside of a, a helicopter that looked for mortars being shot at the helicopter. So it had an optical sensor looking for flashes. It had a bunch of microphones listening for the whistle of the projectile going by. And I actually got to talk to the inventor about that one. Um, who said that he actually made the development team go up in the helicopter when they were proving the uh, device out. <laughs> like, oh. really? <laughs> yes. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, apparently, what he said the, the problem was insurgents know that if they use an active uh, radar device, like a missile, uh, the helicopter has defenses for that and will shoot back. Um, but if they just put out an old mortar and start taking shots, that's not as trackable or wasn't at the time. So this was to defend against that. Very cool. Yeah, I just had a recent one come up where um, it got allowed where it was a VR uh, system and it primarily had to deal with um, tracking the eye and rendering the image. So the way it did it was, it would track your eye and calculate the point at which your eye was moving its fastest, right? Your highest velocity. And based on that calculation, it estimated where your eye would uh, stop moving. So where your gaze would end. And in that fraction of a second, we're talking about milliseconds, the computations worked. Um, that the, Im the final image was generated where your final position of your eye was going to be. And these are just like crazy, insanely fast calculations happening. Think about like if you're gazing from left just to go to center view, right? Like the sheer power of that calculation just like blew my mind with that. I have a question about um, programming um, and uh, patent copyright protection. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm working on, I have a programmer on staff and he's writing up uh, custom software for what we're doing for the, to control the hardware. Is that software, which would be in conjunction with the hardware that I'm working on, is that software something that would be protected under copyright because it's basically a, a written volume of information that came from my friend's head? Or is that something that would be under a utility patent? Uh, the answer is both. So um, source code is subject to copyright law. And there were, there's been several famous cases here in Silicon Valley uh, where um, one company has accused another company of stealing their source code and filed suit under copyright. 
the actual algorithms can be covered by a patent as well. So if it's a particularly new and non-obvious way of going about doing manipulation of the data, which is the sort of case that I, stuff I look at all the time, um, it can be patented if it's more than just a mathematical idea. So uh, the, the current state of law from the Supreme Court is that you have to be tied to some sort of a machine um, the, as opposed to just a free, free floating idea. And it sounds like you've, you've got some hardware there, so that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I do, I do have a significant amount of hardware, but it's a, a modification of hardware that can be purchased, but extensively modified. And, and part of this extensive modification is the software component. So we would be starting mm -hmm. with someone else's computer and software and extensively modifying their software to fit what we're doing with their hardware, again, extensively modified, would that modification of their software and their hardware to fit a completely different uh, function of operations, would both of those be protected or would it be some level of infringing upon the original manufacturer's product? Those are actually, I think that's two different questions. Um, if your modifications to an existent system and software is new and novel, not obvious, then that's patentable. Um, the actual use of their hardware or modification of it, I would think is going to be subject to whatever sales agreement that you have entered into with them. Well, we haven't entered into a sales agreement. We're getting the hardware used, you know, from the used market. Mm. Um, but the, uh, let's just say, hypothetically, it's an engine. And that we're changing the way the engine operates so profoundly that it no longer resembles what the original manufacturer had intended. And in doing so, we needed software to control it, to operate it in the new way. So not only are we starting with their engine and their computer, but we're modifying both extensively. Would that be an infringement of the patents that they hold and, and the copyrights for their software? For, for that level of question, I think making use of the resources is the best bet. The, um, I don't want to give you guidance that um, is not true legally. Um, okay. So I, I, I strongly suggest actually asking that question to an attorney that, that specializes in IP. Excellent. Thank you. I will also add um, with their software bit, um, it's important to keep in mind like the timelines um, for patents and copyrights. So your hmm. quicker rights are going to be given in copyrights for your protection for your software. Uh, patents can take close to two years. I think that's where the pendency is sitting at right now. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think that in that two year, or yeah, did I say two year or two months? Two years. Yeah, you said the so right two thing. years. Yeah, so if you think that in two years, your software will be outdated, then it's probably better to first chase after your copyright protection um, and then file your patent application. Okay, yeah, because we're gonna be rolling product out in 12 months. So two years, it'll be outdated easily. Mm -hmm. um, to equivocate on that a little bit, if, if it's okay with you, Balram, is if you have a fundamental idea that's going to persist through multiple iterations of the software, um, it may still be worthwhile applying for a patent for that because you know there's 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 something fundamental to the the software stack up that you've created you, sure you're going to be evolving it you're going to be adding new features you're going to you know be doing revisions but whatever the fundamental idea is you may very well want to have protection for okay yeah especially with these like brand new ideas like i see it a lot with um just like anything that's just not ever been patented, you'll, I'll come across the same inventor um, 
where they might have gotten their first patent back in 2017, 2018. And then I just keep getting newer modifications just from that inventor almost every year, year and a half, like clockwork. Um, and they kind of just like hold the entire space for it. What about an inventor who's died? What is the protections there on their patent if they've passed away? That's a good question. I not familiar off the top of my head. Brent, do you have it? Um, I not knowing anything, I would say that the um, his rights would pass to uh, or their their rights would pass to their estate. Um, and then however the estate is structured, it could go be passed on to descendants. It could be, you know, maybe there's no estate and it goes back to, you know, there's no protection at all. Um, but it's going to be, you know, what did they actually provide for before they passed? Okay. Um, it looks like we have a Great question Chris. in the chat of, can trade secrets be licensed or sold to other companies? I think we covered this a little bit, but um, yeah. If it's a secret, it seems to me that that would be, you know, in total, totally up to the company. Um, you know, Coca-Cola is my, you know, our favorite example of, uh, of a trade secret has a bunch of bottling companies that make Coca-Cola. I'm not sure that they're all exclusively owned by the top level company. So if, if, if I am correct in my understanding of that, the answer is yes. Um, I'm going to expand on that, but let's say I worked at Coca-Cola and I know their secret sauce, their secret mix, and I moved to Pepsi and told them to make it this way. That's suable. Is that correct? Because that's a trade secret that's patented. Um, it's, if it's a trade secret, it's by not patented. Is if if you actually patented it, you had to tell the world how you made it. Um, that's why companies like like Coca Cola go to great lengths to guard their secret sauce, their their or their their secret formula. Uh, if they let it out, it's out. Um, and whether they could pursue an employee for you know, you know basically breaking the rules and taking their formula with them. They, it probably would be a violation of their employment contract, um, but that's going to be, you know, what did Coca-Cola write into their employment contract that this employee had to sign? So it would be a, a they could lawsuit for something different, but not for any patent office related issues. Yeah, because a trade secret isn't something the patent office grants any protection for. It's, it's purely on the owner of that trade secret to protect it. I don't know if anybody else is in this boat, but my kids watched way too much SpongeBob and I always think about the Krabby Patty formula. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he gets it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's that's a trade secret. Yep, you have no protection of it uh, aside from whatever you do yourself. Versus a patent, you have a U.S. patent. Um, you find counterfeit products coming into the United States. You can go to U.S. Border and Customs and tell them, "Hey, these are counterfeit infringing products," and they'll put a stop to it right then and there. And I think you said you had a follow-up question. That was my follow-up question, sorry. Okay. Sorry, but, um, but otherwise, I think perfect. Um, if anyone wants to reach out, is that personally to you guys or do you guys have any contacts that you want to share for competitors to reach out? Brent, how did you get the last name Fairbanks? Uh so in 1633, uh, Jonathan Fairbanks came to the United States, came up with the last name. Um, I'm descended from him. 
and another person that descended from him was uh, uh, Charles Fairbanks, who was Teddy Roosevelt's vice president. And one of the notable things he did was negotiate the border between Alaska and Canada. Any and, relation in there to Fairbanks Morse? Um, the scale people? Yeah, it's every, see, because this one guy made up the name. So everybody that has the last name of Fairbanks is related to each other somehow. Um, I haven't done the exact uh, genealogy to figure out exactly you know, what the linkage is for me. Um, but in theory, I'm related to the actor. I'm related to the guy that invented the scale, um, et cetera. Very cool. I, um, my family came and visited Fairbanks uh, six years ago this May. So we, we actually have seen it. 